Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for watching or listening to another episode of the Brickwork Podcast. Today, we have Amanda Gattenby from Crate Modular, who has a background in construction and development, primarily of affordable housing. She came to Container Modular as a solution for common project problems, such as scheduling and obtaining approvals and sustainability. Hi, Amanda. Hi, John. Thanks for having me on today. Absolutely. So let's get right into it. I'm super excited about the topic, and I've been meaning to kind of uh, bring someone on that's a resident expert because I have questions, and I know our uh, viewers uh, and users are going to have questions. So first, you know, in your own words, kind of if you can um, uh, describe what Crate Modular does, uh, you know, high level. Sure. Highest level, we're a Lego factory. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> we make the Legos and we bring the Legos to you. Yeah. So if you can build it, you can build it out of crates. So we do everything from single family residential, custom to accessory dwelling units to large multifamily buildings oh, and wow. large um, like civic facilities as well. Got it. So that... Perfect. So um, I guess walk through, because I know uh, a lot of people are more aware of the single family and the ADU use case, maybe, versus multifamily. And, um, you know, we actually provide both now. We started off with multifamily because that was more of in demand with, with uh, LA building as far as uh, the projects and the need for housing. So, but we started, uh, we're launching actually a more single lot subdivision ADU uh, report, which will be, you know, in connection with the local architect or a, a, a list of architects that help site plan it, right? Like 2D and, and what can, what's uh, highest best use of the ADU. Um, you know, obviously we'll talk after this, but we're also including vendors uh, that could provide options for that, but that's gonna be on the, the you know, single family uh, side, but I'm more, I'm more curious about the multifamily now. Wh how and where and why? <laughs> well, um, when I first joined the predecessor company to Crate Modular, um, they were primarily, they were also doing container modular. Mm -hmm. They were primarily in the education space, oh, okay. kind of replacing those old wood modulars you see in every LAUSD campus. Oh, yeah. You know, um, I, I know my kid went to school in those as well. I grew up in LAUSD. So. <laughs> yeah. so you know what I'm talking about, but they were replacing those. And so they were able to achieve a state approval with the DSA approval. Oh, I see. Um, and then my background was in affordable housing hmm. and I came on the scene and I was like, guys, affordable housing. <laughs> um, so um, that company produced the first shipping container affordable housing project in the nation. It's mm. called Potter's Lane. It's in unincorporated Orange County and it serves formerly homeless veterans. Awesome. So that was the world I was really familiar with was um, subsidy based affordable housing. Right. Um, since I've been with Crate, it's really kind of exploded and I've seen a lot of different use of our product, everything from homeless shelters mm. to bougie bed and breakfast at a winery. Wow, it has multiple uses. So uh, that's awesome. So um, I'm, I actually just uh, tagging off, um, I, I, we haven't had an affordable housing developer on yet. I've been looking for one, but you know, when it comes to development, we were talking about how niche this is, but actually it's not, right? Because there's- oh, it's, you know, it's a booming I, industry specifically in California. Agreed. But like even just housing and development in general and construction, we can go in so many verticals. So like, you know, I've had a few options to invite a hotel developer or, you know, a student housing developer or senior housing. So there's a workforce. I mean, there's multiple ways to go about this and get very granular here, but let me um, uh, uh, ask you about affordable. So, you know, obviously, uh, top down, it's you're trying to build housing, right, at affordable cost. That's just the way it is, but it's so much more complicated in that there's a lot of variables, right, in obviously what we do, which is just the entire land use part of it and entitlement, which could you know, take a long time. It's not consistent in every city, in every 
property even, right? Like everything is so different there. That's just the first part. And then there's the variables of cost, which is the labor and then the materials. Uh, and then uh, I guess, um, you know, beyond that, there's some other stuff. So can you talk to that? Like, so, sure. um, and I know this is kind of off topic, but when you said affordable- No, it's all on topic. Awesome, awesome. So, you know, from what I know, you get you have to get um, uh, a subsidy in bonds, but that shifts with California and federal every year, right? They put a focus on sometimes workforce and then veteran and then homeless. And so this thing shifts on how much of, uh, capital is available for use, right? And approvals. And then based on that shifting kind of product, uh, you know, the, uh, the subsidy, you go and build that. But is there any insights you could share on still the running challenges for affordable housing? Sure. So affordable primarily means it does not mean affordable to build. Unfortunately, because of these right. subsidies, they usually come with encumbrances such as prevailing wage mm. and other um, sustainability checkpoints and uh, other right. things that can increase your project cost. Right. What it means is that there's a deed restriction on who can rent the units. Uh, they have to be under a certain income level to be right. able to rent the units. Right. Um, so traditionally it has been with subsidies mm. but since i'm in such an innovative construction space mm. i'm also seeing a lot of innovative financial models and oh. i'm seeing a real trend towards still housing vulnerable populations and yeah. still voluntarily doing deed restrictions right. um, to get density bonuses or for uh, other reasons I but funding it privately with private capital mm, and therefore it great. brings your project costs down you can do a different model you can master lease it to a social service provider so you right. have guaranteed income right so there's all sorts of really cool creative things going on in the space mm. um as well as you know there's some wonderful as you know density bonuses around affordability mm. um that it can give you kind of unlimited density to mm -hmm. some points and mm -hmm. greatly reduce your parking. Yes. Um, so, and, and all you have to be technically um, on affordable is 80% AMI or less. Right. And so there are some areas of town where 80% AMI is still a, a rent that can make your project pencil. Yes, agreed. And given what's going on in the pandemic, we might already be at 80% in the urban exactly. cores, right, right now. Um, okay, great. No, I, I, that's super fascinating. I think um, the private capital is going to be a game changer if it gets more available for, for a lot of developers. I've even... Uh, um, Opportunity zones are yes, happening. Yes, um, there's a lot of capital. Money, yeah. Yes. And crowdfunding, there's a, actually a company out of Echo Park, they chose Echo Park out of everywhere else. And it's essentially kind of a, uh, a B corporation. So all they're meant to do is really empower the residents to reinvest in their community. So they're gonna allocate the crowdfunded money, obviously pay, you know, it's it's your earning, um, uh, whether it's 8% or I, I don't exactly know the details on the yield on that, but you're also putting it to a uh, good cause because they're then purchasing um, vital, uh, you know, real estate in that neighborhood and making sure uh, there aren't other interests, which is the founder told me is really institutional led. So that's really? kind of what's the problem with neighborhoods. It's not, uh, you know, gentrification and that, oh, uh, everyone's just want to be the next Silver Lake. Well, there's a need, but then the actual capital to actually remake a neighborhood is institutional. The REITs have so much buying power, right? So mass, so much capital, and that's what's changing neighborhoods. But anyways, off <laughs> two things I want to respond to. Yes, Number please. One, did you know that the first multi-story container development in the city of Los Angeles, mm. uh, made with shipping containers, mm. was a crowdfunded building? Um, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, awesome! Brilliant. Selling off shares of the building yes. to people who wanted to invest in any homelessness in LA. Agreed. That's awesome. Um, yeah, so that's really cool. Um, and I actually already forgot the second thing. <laughs> that's okay. We'll, we'll think of that. No, I want, so I want to get- Oh, with, new market uh, tax credits. Ah, right. There's other, there's a lot of levers. It just wasn't readily available for developers. And I think that's really what I wanted to get at. And it's affordable, even though it's multifaceted, there's all these variables. There's also solutions um, that are out there. So you just have to start to utilize them and also if they're more readily available for everyone. So, but um, uh, the next question I wanted to ask is, I guess, okay, so 
uh, uh, shipping containers. Okay, so there are some critics out there that have uh, thrown out a lot of uh, maybe concerns, right, of using shipping containers. And a few, I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, uh, but a few have been, you know, the thermal conductivity of steel, right, and how you have to adapt and pay all these additional costs uh, for that. And then also, um, you know, the chemicals in the paint that was uh, purposely added to, you know, withstand the wear and tear while they're exposed to water and, you know, uh, during transport. And then also some of them that say, well, you know, for a shipping container to be feasible, you have to almost buy a new shipping container, purchase one versus reuse an older one. So what would be the, the savings or to the environment or costs by if, if that was, uh, uh, um, you know, your only option. So I just wanted to um, kind of throw that out there to you because uh, and see if you have a response, but then also, um, you know, uh, 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 I guess let everyone know that th those concerns, even though they're warranted, there are, you know, answers to that. Absolutely, there's answers. I love to talk right. about this right. because this, these are some of the most frequent questions that come up around containers. Mm -hmm. So first of all, our company was founded with a tenet of sustainability. Mm. So we have a trade deficit in this country. Yes. We import about 15 million containers and we export about 11. Right. So there's 4 million available containers and most of them are one way. Got it. Oh, I see. Why would um, overseas countries pay to ship an empty back when they can just send us a new one full of stuff? Exactly. Got it. So here we have 4 million available containers mm -hmm. that are made to stuff with 65,000 pounds of material and right. stacked 10 high. Mm -hmm. So they're basically steel moment frame building blocks for us. Yes. yes. So we only source, um, since there's so many containers, we mm -hmm. could we could house 100,000 units mm -hmm. of affordable housing and still not touch the available containers that we have. Got it. We have some work to do. Um, so um, we procure only the best of the best. Since there are so many, we're able to be very picky. Right. Our containers are procured and sourced before they even leave overseas, mm -hmm. mostly China. Mm -hmm. um, we have restrictions that Containers in order to be used by Crate Modular have to only be one way dry goods only. Got it. Every container has a serial number on it. Mm. Um, and that serial number tells you when the container was built, mm. what was in it, when mm. it left, mm. when it came to LA, what it's been doing since. Um, and these containers are tested rigorously for their shipping container life. Right. So they have, you know, various industries and acronyms that test all these containers and then we further do our own testing on the container once it hits it. our parking lot in the city of Carson in Los Angeles County. Got it. Got it. Um, and in regards to the conductivity of the metal, mm -hmm. so we do a thermal break with spray foam mm. and there's three different kinds of insulation in our mm. building. Mm. So we really insulate the heck out of them and there's some byproducts of this. Mm. So it ends up that the units are very acoustically sound. Uh. Um, I was at Potter's Lane, the affordable mm. housing project, jumping up and down and screaming on the second floor. My colleague below could not hear me wow that alone i'm so because i'm actually hyper sensitive to sound i used to live in apartments and condos in various areas and surprisingly enough sound is not is such an added cost there are ways to build around that too but it just costs way too much uh to the containers ever. inherently have that right so there's that's a awesome. reflective that's system what, so it's great. like 12 inches of insulation mm -hmm. in between units yeah the floor ceiling assembly they sit on corner blocks actually so that wow. actual floor is isolated from the ceiling below you do not get that with wood Got it. you have a lot of larger spans than wood um and then the alloy it's actually a steel alloy called core 10 steel mm. um and that's what the containers are made of they're very very strong I see. um and they weather at a rate of one one hundredth of an inch per 100 years mm -hmm. so they're practically indestructible and then we coat it four times with rust primer and color primer and um, exterior latex coatings okay great yeah uh, that that addresses it for me i just wanted to um yeah. kind of uh point that out so um based so you know what are some other, uh, you know, prefab or modular options, I guess, um, meaning I get, you know, if it's prefab, it just is, it innately means 
you're able to build off site. And then if, you know, you just put, um, uh, you know, the economies in scale to work and just say, well, we're just, you know, uh, manufacturing. So we can do these more efficiently off site. We could build mass, bring down costs, all that good stuff. And then essentially move it to the site and stack it, like you had mentioned, like Legos, right? And yeah. so what are some of those other options that are out there? And then is the natural comparison with shipping containers that what you just mentioned that there's, you know, you're not even making a dent in the uh, uh, unused right? Shipping containers that are just out there doing nothing and they're not, you know, so inherently yeah, that is the through Oakland. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're on it both sides for miles. Wow. So yeah, exactly. So I see that too, but I, I want to at least make mention of some other, you know, um, vendors out there or companies yeah. that are doing, um, you know, mod, mod uh, prefab builds. So I came, as I said, to modular from affordable housing. Mm. I built um, 1,100 units in Los Angeles awesome. County. That's great. That's great. So cr conventionally, before mm. I even started with modular. I see. So I've been attracted to modular for a long time. Mm. Um, first of all, the sustainability aspect is very attractive to me. Yes, agreed. We kind of have an extra level because we're using recycled containers, but yes. all modular is more sustainable um, because okay. of the factory controlled environment and less right. waste. Right. Um, and also just why are we doing, construction hasn't changed significantly in 200 years. Yes. Except for the invention of power tools, we're doing it substantially the same as we've always done it. Right. There's not very many other industries that can say that. Mm. So I'm very attracted to technology and doing things in a different way and maybe being a little smarter. And yeah. as I built all those units with conventionally, I started seeing, okay, I'm starting to refine my product. I start mm. to know what size my community room needs to be, you know, where my fire riser needs to go. And now my building is a product. Mm. And that's really something that we're leveraging at Crate Modular. Yeah. You know, John, when we get an approval, it lasts for three years. Mm. So every building that we design then can go into our catalog. And developers can right. look through our catalog and they'll get a fully approved set of plans for a building that's already been designed. Right. You get to skip all of that part. Mm -hmm. You know, architects are... 100% valuable. We need them. Mm -hmm. We need them. Mm -hmm. We are just a material. We are nothing without them. Yes. Um, but do I think that we need to draw a full set of plans for every piece of dirt in Los Angeles? No, not really. Yeah. yeah no. So replication is, is something that attracted me to modular as well. Not so but there are several different types to get back around your question. So mm -hmm. the first type that really popped up was wood modular. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are some companies doing that um, in Idaho, in up in Northern California, Factory OS and Garden. Right. Silver Creek is does a lot of classrooms and single family homes. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some steel modular companies. Mm -hmm. um, Indeed Well uh, is a yeah. steel modular company, a lot like there's that. There's a project in Hollywood that I think Relevant Group's doing in Las Palmas, and it's supposed to be some... 200 unit, all steel, mixed use, modular build, yeah. <laughs> right? So Many cool modular, um, Z modular, um, rad, urban. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to kind of go through what other uh, options are out there, but um, yeah, no, I, I, I still, it still highlights the point that um, it's uh, shipping containers being underutilized and there's just so much of them it's i think um ideal to obviously um go that route so have you looked at um you said there's other uses for this so um you know commercial other different types of commercial uses whether um have you looked into that as far as like is there yeah. like a way let me just tell you yeah, what's sure. on our what's in our factory right Great. now let's do it yeah so um, we made a little research facility for mm -hmm. University of California, Santa Barbara, that's mm -hmm. going to be a researcher's home mm -hmm. in Mammoth. And okay. so that had to have a snow load factor on it. Yes. We're doing a little commercial beer garden um, in Atascadero um, out of shipping containers, like a food court outdoor um, yes. you know, kind of mm -hmm. thing. And it's still going, um, yeah. even though it's pandemic. No, outdoor. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Good. food court, yeah. very big, right? Outdoor Right. Um, we finished two homeless shelters this year. Mm -hmm. um, we replicated it 
So mm. we built the same homeless shelter twice. Oh, awesome. We know there's a need. Let's build yeah. it some more. Yeah. Um, so that was 48 containers to make a 15,000 square foot building. We wow. did nine um, classrooms for uh, middle school in Oak Park. Mm hmm. Um, a couple of ADUs. And right now we're working on a very large project on behalf of the county mm -hmm. um, to do sleeping pods for homelessness. Yeah, um, let's get right into it. So I'm in agreement. I think, um, you know, obviously we have to get from zero to one for brickwork, but uh, kind of our vision for creating this um, was, you know, so how can we be part of the conversation to help with the homeless crisis, right? Because it just keeps ballooning up. And if we only rely on politics, that's never, it's never going to solve itself. It's got to be a, a full on effort, private community. Of course, there's a lot of people out there that are championing this kind of cause. And, uh, you know, albeit I'm not trying to undercut that, but it's too few and it doesn't feel like everyone's vested in it. So all I hear are complaints saying, my goodness, the politicians, um, you know, before it was, you know, uh, they were in certain areas. Now they're in every freeway underpass now and they're ballooning out and there's fires green. I'm like, yeah, you're talking about the problem and you're trying to place the blame <laughs> on the politicians, but no, it's like all of us have to get involved and figure out, okay, what's, what can we do, right? How can we yeah. maximize and utilize some of the capital that we've already voted to um, tackle this into bringing more units or more beds out there that's safe and transitional, right? Like it's, yes. beds is one thing that at least solves the minimum need of them not sleeping on the sleeps or our streets. But I've always thought it should be kind of like an assembly line. It, it, they're not there for just no odd reason. I mean, they need to be rehabilitated, right? So you have to have counselors and psychiatrists <laughs> to, to is diagnose what's going on right at this point and then what kind of help we could provide you in addition to the housing and then there should be more of a um retraining retooling and an ability to uh uh go back out in the job market have counseling and help you know and and off drugs and all that good stuff but again this is multifaceted. but anyways i just there's just a few things that come to mind yeah, um, from working in this in this you know sector for so long is yeah. um, we have to have community buy-in. Yeah, so I, I many agree. projects get yeah, yeah get, you can't have protests <laughs> not in my uh, backyard or street. Yeah, I, yeah. that one's ridiculous. Yimbies need to turn into yimbies because yeah, we need always. to love our neighbors and yeah. get everybody off the street. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. if you'd rather step over them than have them live in a yeah, building yeah. next to you, okay. there's a problem. Agreed. Um, we need to, I think there's a real public private opportunity here because there mm -hmm. are funds deployed, as you mentioned, right. but the barriers and the encumbrances that come with those funds are right. many. Yes. They're very difficult to yeah. deploy right. um, because of all the layers of bureaucracy that are on it. And, right. and a lot of them are great layers. Like, are you using a local workforce? And what's the, you know, um, are you using a, a, diverse workforce you know and so yeah. these are all great things but they right. are hoops to jump through right, right. right. um so a public private private money goes so much farther than I public agree. money it I really agree. does and you know things that we can put our our money into that make a modest return like mm. that um project in south la that i was mentioning from mm. flyaway homes they mm. they they make a modest return, but those people are investing in ending homelessness and that's Agreed. a huge impact. And so yeah. that's something we need to consider. And then I think what you're doing with brick work is actually valuable in identifying the development paths of least resistance. Yes, yes, it's that's all we wanna do. We wanna bring more players involved because I'm a big, and I say this all countless times, I'm a big Elon Musk fanboy. I love what he's <laughs> doing. He's but he's one that's trying to do everything. And I just feel um, that's BS. There's a lot of people out there that have, are capable that, you know, that are smart, capable, that either chase money, either in investment banking and work in Wall Street. We don't need another amazing mortgage-backed security vehicle, blah, blah, blah. Don't put so much effort in those things, right? And then there's tech. There's some great things that have come to tech, but a lot of people now are just chasing the money and trying to create the next billion uh, unicorn startup. 
I think more people need to be involved in development. So we um, need developers. It's here. It's here. Yes, but like the housing, the I mean, like with that Elon Musk mindset, with like being innovative and and changing at scale, not these little mini projects. And you make your limited partners money, and they made a yield, and you got a cut, and you keep continuing that. No, I think really to make disruptive change, we need people that are activated and smart in other areas or industries to come here and go, okay, great. Brickwork at least gets through the land use part of it. And then I don't know if you know, but we started a relationship with KTGY, which is a oh, cool. architecture firm. And so we we're, know them. Yeah, we're providing Shout math. out to Mark Oberholzer. <laughs> That's so funny. I'm going to get them on a podcast. I'm actually working with them on this project that we're doing. So they partnered with us. We could announce it here because we've already announced it in previous podcasts, but we're, they're doing concept massing on these sites. So now they're helping uh, our users figure out, okay, the very initial part of the AutoCAD process is figuring out what you want out of the site. And let's just physically put that together. But we're trying to plug and play. I had automated parking, uh, park, was it Park Plus, um, on a previous podcast, and we're trying to get her to provide a proposal for developers to go, hey, can this site be optimal for, uh, you know, automated parking solutions? What's your space? What do you need? Exactly. How high? So I, I envision it more of Brickwork is the start point in the conversation for non or um you don't even need a developing background is what I'd like to do. I'd like to get people on the path of just being open to putting effort into this. And then we could point them in the right direction on best and highest use. Even if it requires a, de a development manager, a project manager who's topped out, you know, 10,000 units in his career. And now he's a consultant. Yeah, that might be someone that can make sure that you're not going to go off a cliff in, in all these varying degrees of managing the, the general GCs and the subs and getting over the hurdles of the entitlement. And I mean, there's so many of that variability through that. We want to provide that kind of, you know, guardrails, I guess, in, 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 in options so that we could just bring more people that are disruptive to go, well, maybe we crowdfund for homelessness. Maybe we, you know, without any restrictions, why can't we do that? So right. anyways. <laughs> we can. We can. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I'm with you. I'm, I'm definitely uh, in that part. And thank you for saying uh, Brickwork as well. So now um, moving forward, okay. Um, given the pandemic where, you know, there is, I just read an article uh, this morning saying San Francisco is in for it. They are in trouble. LA, not so much, because I think there are different things, different factors, geographic. There's a lot. Of, we're not the same city as San Francisco, but Absolutely. their numbers as of today are bad. They're down. The rents are down 30%. There is actually a migration happening out of the city, right? Yeah. And so um, not so much in LA, because I think what do you mean out of the city? It's a, <laughs> this whole city is not considered a real city. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, but what do you see like us or moving forward with uh, Crate Modular? What what type of like new projects are you open to? Is it going to be in between urban and suburban cores? Are there going to be, right? Like different, like as people move in and are more open to working remotely, what do you see moving forward? Yeah, so I see when pandemic hit, we didn't know how it was going to go. We thought maybe people okay. would be risk averse to a new building type, yeah. but that is not the case. The modular technology is going is full scale. Yeah. Yes. Just like zoom technology yes. during the pandemic, it's yes. driven, right? Yes. So we were just setting that um, homeless shelter a couple months ago in mm. Merced mm. and a 15,000 square foot facility was being set and there were only six men on site. Oh, wow. So that's valuable, wow. right? Mm. Um, I'm also seeing co-housing mm -hmm. um, is a yes. theme that I keep seeing. Um, yeah. I'm seeing more of these privately funded for vulnerable mm -hmm. populations. Yeah. Uh, I am seeing projects right now as people are scrambling to spend the CARES money um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the COVID money that they have, and they right. are trying to deploy homelessness solutions. Um, yes. for, and we have a couple different deals with different municipalities with that. Great. Great. Um, and I'm seeing also live work space. Yes. So kind of some interesting designs coming out. Um, Rad Lab is a really forward thinking yeah. architecture firm out of San Diego. They do yep. a lot with containers. We love mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. um, and they 
are coming up with really great live work option designs. Yeah. And we're seeing a lot of outdoor, more than one of these outdoor food court kind of yes. options and yeah. concepts coming as well. Um, and then we are still working on a few schools because mm. um, I think some facilities need to grow. They need to give themselves a little more room. Agreed. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm seeing trending. And then as well as, you know, increased uh, government projects as well. That's great. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll keep continuing uh, this conversation, but I actually, I think I want to present Crate Modular as a vendor and an option, just like what we're doing with all the partners. So, you know, we definitely want uh, a lot of, um, you know, because we're the tip of the spear, right? So we're the initial, the brokers either look for sites based on our information that might uh, work for developers. And then, you know, um, that starts the, the ball, right? So the more properties that are proposed to developers of varying degrees and varying uses, adaptive reuse or redevelopment uh, cases, just opens the door for more different type of innovative builds. That's what I think if, if at scale. Yeah, and we can talk about it because there are projects that lend themselves more to, to a container modular. Yes, agreed. So I, I definitely want to present uh, you guys more often to more de <laughs> developers. Awesome. Uh, moving I can forward. give you some tools for that. <laughs> okay, great. So final thing, I guess, thank you so much for this. Um, if you have anything else you want to share, I guess, uh, that you guys are working on or an ask or any anything anything as a final well thought. we've um launched our adu program yes so we have accessory dwelling units that are already pre by the state so mm -hmm. we're trying to make it as easy as possible um for people what is the cost here? of that because i you know there's cover there's well there's uh, even a whole host of more companies that are coming through right now but it seems like the costs still run any, of course, these are all based on sites specific. I understand. Site what you're specific. To... I can only quote you the Legos. So yeah, 45 yeah. for a single, 75 for a double, mm. around 85 to 90 for um, like a, a larger 480 square foot. Um, I, 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 I want to touch on this too. Again, um, we're as Brickwork launching an ADU report just based oh, yeah. on the demand of that. And what we're doing is partnering with local architects, you know, either in the West Adams area or Hammond Park, you know, some of these neighborhoods can be different as far as how the houses are designed, the lot sizes, are they on a hill, are they not? So they're different. So we decided let's just go with those local uh, architects to help site plan, maybe do some modeling or massing if it's required, right? If it's going to be of that type or uh, a project, but um, we'd love to partner with you as well. Yeah, we have some off the show. I'm really passionate about ADUs because I know they're not like a giant 100 unit supportive housing complex, sure, sure. but they really can help um, impact homelessness by keeping people in place longer and, and you know giving kids a place to come after college yeah. and et cetera, et cetera. So we're working on ADUs. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really excited about a five story, 75 unit project that we're doing on the corner of Normandy and Pico. Oh, tell me. Yes. That's happening. That's happening um, in 2021. Okay. And we're also building, we, there's an amazing partnership of a large free clinic provider and a homelessness services provider. And they're joining forces to show the link between housing and health in San Diego. Wow. And we're doing a large um, supportive housing project down there, 160 units. That's awesome. That's exciting. Yeah. I mean, this is um, it speaks to the premise of, of what we want to do. It's just new solutions, uh, faster at scale. That's the only way. We can't do just one-off projects. It's exactly. the spread. That's great. But Replication. A, yeah, application have a meaningful impact to really, really solve this uh, uh, issue and problem, which is there's, there's no way that we can't provide enough housing. It's just the, the obstacles and barriers I think we created. <laughs> Exactly. So if right? we, create them, we can tear them down. Exactly. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, it, uh, amazing talk. I love this. And we'll, we'll connect after this as well. But uh, to everyone else, thank you for joining and look forward to seeing you guys on the next episode. Bye, Amanda. Thanks.